So one question that came in this week is from a woman who says that she was never allowed to watch movies or read books that contained any type of magic or witchcraft. Um, this, she says, actually applied even to Mary Poppins or Beauty and the Beast, uh, anything like that, and Narnia. And now that she's a mom, she is currently embroiled in the same fight but from a different side. And she wants to know uh, what the opposing arguments are. She wants a defense of magic in children's books. Okay. Well, the defense of magic, defending magic is like defending nuclear weapons or defending <laughs> spears. Um, it's not, it's, it's who's using it to what end and what point. Um, so if you say you weren't allowed to read any books with magic in them, well that takes out the book of Genesis and that takes out yeah. the Gospel of Mark and that takes out the Gospel of Matthew. And So what is walking on water exactly? Well, you don't solve the problem by saying, oh, no, that's a Bible miracle. Um, that's not magical. <laughs> that's not magical. He's just walking on water. He's just raising the dead. He, well, okay, the, in the biblical miracles, they don't wear a wizard's hat, and they don't, they don't do what they do. Their acts of power are for service, not for control, but their acts of power that, that, are, that intervene in the world. And so the Bible's full of it. So the, um, at the same time, the Bible also prohibits necromancy, and, and Isaiah talks about the wizards who chirp and mutter and that sort of thing. And so there is a there is a type of wizardry and magic that the Bible is against and hostile to. But there's also a kind of magic that generally goes by a different name that the Bible's not hostile to. So when if you define magic as an attempt to manipulate the world in such a way as to exercise power over other human beings, that would be objectionable. But science falls under the same yeah. heading. So you, and and that's and it's not surprising because the origins of chemistry and alchemy were at the same time. They were trying to. It was the same fundamental project. So if you're trying to manipulate matter so that you can have mastery over other other human beings. That's objectionable, biblically. Um, but to, to take the, my, the best illustration, of, I think, of a biblical view of magic can be found in, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. So you have the ultimate magical artifact, the one ring that binds all the other rings. And, and the good guys find this ring, and this is something that uh, places it in, in distinction from Harry Potter. The, the good guys find the ring, and then the whole structure of the book is the good guys refusing to use the ring, and, um, and the, their whole mission is to destroy yeah. it. So even though Gandalf lights pine cones on fire and can make some impressive smoke rings and intervenes with power in different ways, the fundamental project that Tolkien sets before us, I think, is the most profoundly anti-magical tract in modern times magical in the bad sense. Yeah, you wouldn't say anti-magical as much as anti-sorcery. Yeah, anti-sorcery. Anti um, so the, the fact that Gandalf, he, um, he's not really a wizard, but he looks like a wizard, dresses like a wizard. He's, he gets called one. He gets yeah. called one. He's one of the lesser Valar, technically. But the, but the point is that some people get spooked by that and say, okay, he's, this is hocus pocus. Well, no, their, their whole project is to eliminate the kind of magic that is power-hungry. Power-hungry magic is objectionable. Uh, but the work of the elves in art and artifice is lovely. So um, the, the, is the issue for magic is what is being done in the Narnia stories and who's doing it and to what end. So in the Narnia stories, uh, the sorts of things that Aslan does are the sorts of things that Jesus does that are remarkable and that, and that don't operate according to uh, uh, what we would call natural law. They're, they're interventions, and these interventions are not objectionable. And even there, I think with Gandalf, unless I'm very much mistaken, you'll never see him mix a potion. Right. I can't, I can't remember a time when he prepares some sort of preparation or right. potion making or anything like that. It's all power that he has the way a bird has the power to fly. Yeah, it comes out of who he is. Yeah. Uh, good magic comes out of who the person is. Aslan has authority 
simply because of who he is. Gandalf has authority because of who he is. He's not, um, he, Gandalf doesn't go down in the basement to to try to figure out an open sesame, if I say it this way or that way. Yeah, magic, you know, you know, magic words and potions. Magic. Of, now, there, there's some, there is a, there there's words is a, of power. There's words of power, and there's, yeah. you know, there are things that are, are um, impressive that way, but you, it's not like you're trying to grab this, manipulate it, and then impose it on people. And that's that's what I think is objectionable in scripture about magic. Yeah. You know, I, I think that one of the most embarrassing things is that Christians react against magic in literature. Just right. because we have the most magical book, which we uh, allegedly take at face value, allegedly believe. Right. And then we proceed to act like the world is completely other than the world described by Scripture. Right. And one of the things that bothers me actually about one children's movie, The Prince of Egypt, uh, the the Exodus film, which is otherwise I think a pretty fun kids movie, is the fact that they impose an idea on the uh, wizards of the Egyptian court, uh, the magicians of Pharaoh, that they were doing sleight of hand. Right. Uh, it was it was David Copperfield magic. Right. Uh, they didn't really turn staffs into snakes. Right. But in scripture they did. Right. They they actually were able to do this and then the difference was that Moses' snake could eat theirs. Exactly. Not that you know that Moses wouldn't do it and not that they couldn't do it. They could both do it just Moses is more, more powerful. Right. And you have to you have to ask okay, uh, given that Moses was not a sorcerer and given that Jesus was not a sorcerer, what would you call what they did? Divide the sea, walk through on dry land, <laughs> um, water from a rock, water from a rock, yeah. bread from bread from the sky, or or staple food from the sky, walking on water, turning water to wine, raising the dead. Uh, what would have been the word that went out through Judea, Judea when word uh, arose that Jesus was coming? Well, they wouldn't think of him as a necromancer or a sorcerer, but it was most emphatically not pure enlightenment let's yeah. guide this by natural law that's I, so i think christians who are hostile to the wrong kind of magic throw out the baby with the bathwater they throw out the miraculous in scripture and they lose a great deal well even with jericho there's an actual ritual performed yeah so they're they're given the formula what you have to do around the walls of jericho then the city's basically going to fall down right and that's you know that that's not even Moses do well, it for you. Well, t t t take another example of that. Suppose you had a fairy tale of a, of a boy who went to giant land and he had to walk around the Let's giant. call him Jack. Let's call him Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had to walk around the giant's castle seven times and then shout and then the castle fell down. What would you call that yeah. in that story? Yeah, obviously it's a charm. It's, right. you know, it's magical. Yeah.